This time on Earth Focus, statesman and author Russell Peterson urges patriots to stand up for the environment. Also, greener technology takes the dirt and the perk out of dry cleaning. And the last day in the life of the Embry Dam, a video journal of Fredericksburg's decisive action to restore a river. All coming up on Earth Focus. Russell Peterson, the former director of the Council on Environmental Quality during the Nixon and Ford administrations and a former Republican governor of Delaware, has written a new book that blasts the environmental record of President George W. Bush. The book, Patriots Stand Up, This Land is Our Land, Fight to Take It Back, accuses the Bush administration of broadly deceiving the American people, not just about the environment, but about the war in Iraq, terrorism, and the economy. Earth Focus recently spoke to the elder environmental statesman and author. I became deeply concerned about the direction our country was going. I was proud of being a Republican, and so many of the things I believed in were established with major role by the Republican Party. Of course, in bipartisan efforts with Democrats. But over the years, I saw more and more of the far-right Republicans coming aboard with their radical agenda. At first, there were so few, it didn't make any difference. But now, they're running the White House and the Congress. And their radical agenda is taking us directly in the opposite of the American way of life that I have learned to love and admire. I think it's vital that the American people recognize the breadth of this attack. This isn't just a normal political campaign. This is a decision-making process. We have to decide, are we going to go down that road that these far-right Republicans have started us down, or are we going to revert to our old American way of life? the one that's been developed over many decades. And uh, I, of course, firmly believe that the tragedy is happening and we need to stand up and fight to change it. And to do so, fight with a ballot. Use democracy now in order to take back America. And in the process, we can demonstrate what true patriotism is. We don't have to be concerned about the right-wingers labeling us as unpatriotic. We need to just point out we are American patriots and we're going to fight for the American way of life. And now's the time for us to stand up and do so. One of the reasons why this administration has in such a short interval of three years made so many of these drastic changes is because they are experts at deceiving. They take programs which are known to be false, present them as being true, and do it so effectively that what is false is widely believed as being true. And in effect, they're conning the American people. Now, the pinnacle of this program was when they decided to go to war against Iraq. And they used seven reasons for doing that. Now we know all seven were false. And, but they do a similar thing in the environment, labeling programs that they're carrying out, like healthy forests and clear skies, in a way that people think that they are pro-environment programs when they're doing just the opposite. President Bush has the worst grade ever of an American president from an environmental standpoint. In fact, the noted League of Conservation voters have given him an F. No time did they ever give a president before such a demeaning grade. But that doesn't only apply to the president. That applies to the leadership of the Congress as well. In the last session of the Congress, there were 84 Republicans there, including all the leaders of the Senate and the House, 
who had a zero rating. They never ever voted for a positive environmental issue. When I reported to Presidents Nixon and Ford, I was there in the role of an environmentalist, head of the Council on Environmental Quality. And there I saw firsthand this rabid attitude of some of those leaders about environmental issues. That was particularly true of Dick Cheney, who was the chief of staff for President Ford when I was reporting to President Ford. I noticed the attitude toward a number of these people about the UN. Their theme was we need to marginalize the United Nations. I have been very proud and I think Americans overwhelmingly have been proud of the development of the United Nations after World War II. A community of nations which has faced up together many problems, put resources and personnel to work on those problems, and we made a lot of progress. And the United States has been a key actor in this, not only deeply involved, but putting up a good hunk of the resources to carry out those activities. We need the United Nations. We cannot solve these world problems by ourselves, and the United Nations needs us. But what have these characters done in Washington? They have actually said to hell with the UN and uh, withdrawn from many critical treaties which were worked out after a lot of effort with major roles by U.S. participants. We certainly have a moral obligation to establish American leadership again in the world environmental movement. And we need to motivate this army of citizens who strongly believe in protecting the environment. One of the problems in turning people on about key environmental issues is environmental protection deals with the future. It doesn't deal with some immediate thing like a job, for example. And environmental protection is so fundamentally important to all of us, but particularly to our children and to future generations. And people have to recognize that I have a moral obligation to be concerned about the kind of environment my kids and other in future generations will be living in. And be so energized by that that they stand up and are counted that they will work to get the right people in office who are going to protect the environment. Perchloroethylene, or perk, the chemical solvent used by most dry cleaning stores, may cause cancer and has been a public health concern since the late 1970s. But until recently, there were few alternatives to perk for people looking to clean clothes with tough stains or made with fine fabrics. But now, new green garment cleaning technologies are helping take the perk and the dirt out of clothes. The most surprising new technology, called professional wet cleaning, is an update of the oldest method used to clean clothes, washing clothes in soap and water. Tammy Herndon Kernis is a professional wet cleaner who runs the Laundry Club in Leesburg, Virginia, a basic courier laundry service that developed professional wet cleaning to meet customer demands for dry cleaning. The facility, installed in addition to her family home, features the latest wet cleaning technology, a $60,000 Frio system made in Korea. At first, it was very frightening. Um, you know, the thought of putting woolen suits or leather into water and making it come out cl not only clean but not losing color or not having shrinkage, it was very frightening in the beginning. But once uh, we started working at it every day and talking to other people in the industry that had some experience with it, we worked it out. We made it work and we've come a long way by working with the chemical companies that create the um, chemistry needed to, to do the wet cleaning, which is all biodegradable chemistry, 
and working with the equipment manufacturers on making, building better wet cleaning machines and better finishing machines. And it, we've t gone from making it a very long, drawn out process um, and very costly to making it just as efficient and cost effective as dry cleaning. A new study of dry cleaning technologies by Brennan Research Group reports that between 80 and 85 percent of clothes can be cleaned using wet cleaning, regardless of fabric type or what the clothing label says. The environmental impact from wet cleaning, as long as non-toxic detergents are used, is primarily energy and water use and non-toxic wastewater disposal. Using carbon dioxide may be the most promising new method for cleaning clothes. At the hanger store in San Diego, Garments are cleaned by this Micelle machine that uses liquefied CO2 gas under high pressure that has been recycled from industrial emissions. Store owner Gordon Shaw was keen on becoming the first pure CO2 cleaner in Southern California and he is confident in the new technology. Well, the CO2 method cleans clothes as well as perk, assuming uh, as long as it's not the real heavily soiled clothes. With, uh, Heavily soiled garments, we do need to do a lot more manual spotting. However, on uh, the high-end garments, it's a lot more, a uh, lot gentler on the uh, fabrics, the dyes, so it's a lot, uh, it extends the life of the clothes. Because of the labor for extra spotting and the cost of the new technology, prices at hangers are about 20% higher than other cleaners nearby. But the store has plenty of customers who like the service and are willing to pay more. They don't smell. That's, I think that's one of the, the big things, you know, because usually you do get that kind of chemical smell from other cleaners. From here, I've never noticed that, you know, and they're soft and perfect, so I'm very happy. I keep coming back. Despite being completely non-toxic, the CO2 cleaning process is not without environmental impact, since CO2 emissions of any kind contribute to climate change. During the wash cycle of the hangar's CO2 machine, about 10 pounds of recycled carbon dioxide escape into the atmosphere. To put that in perspective, in one year, the hangar's store emits the same amount of CO2 emitted yearly by one Hummer SUV or by a little more than two Honda Accords. While the impact is relatively small for a daily business serving many customers, CO2 technology is not environmentally benign. While the cost of new CO2 technology is high, the Brennan Research Group reports that CO2 equipment lasts twice as long or longer than other machines. Stores like Hangers in San Diego also benefit by investment grants currently being offered by California's South Coast Air Quality Management District, which is enforcing a phase-out of PERC in the region and offering incentives to cleaners that make the switch to greener technology. The Embry Dam was built in 1910 by the city of Fredericksburg, Virginia to harness the power of the Rappahannock River. The dam was breached this past February when explosives planted by the Army Corps of Engineers blew apart its concrete walls. The historic event drew a crowd of thousands who came to witness the spectacle and to celebrate the restoration of their community's river. Earth Focus joined the onlookers and presents this video journal of the breach of the Embry Dam. This is the uh, target species for the removal of the dam here. This is what this is all about. Yeah. Who are you guys with? I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And uh, what is this going to mean for the American shad? Okay. And then oh gosh, it means that it's about 80 more miles of uh, habitat that these fish haven't been able to reach for over 100 years that they will now have access to. So by opening this uh, river, we're giving them 106 miles of, of spawning habitat. We're thinking that it would probably support about 70,000 American shad and about 700,000 herring. 
Well, kind of grew up here in Fredericksburg. Uh, been here the best part of my life, born in Ro uh, Roanoke, Virginia. But uh, been here most of my life and did a lot of fishing on the river. And we used to canoe on it and uh, we always had to stop at the dam and carry our canoes around. So we're just happy to see it going because the dam has been there ever since I can remember and served no purpose. Well, it's a beautiful dam. When we portaged around it when we were canoeing, just to be able to look under there and to actually see it up close, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful structure, but it's falling apart, so something has to be done. It's wonderful to see the Embry family and realize that they represent that in just three generations, our understanding and our view of the usefulness of this river has changed enormously. And we've gone from what was a very, very exciting time and a, and a tremendous event in Fredericksburg in 1910 when we harnessed the power of this river. And now, just three generations later, we realize that today the river is most valuable in the state in which it was created and we are returning it to that state. But while it only took us three generations, think about the Shad who will swim upstream starting in just a few weeks. They will be 40 generations removed from their ancestors who swam up the Rappahannock in the 18th century and in the 19th century until it was dammed. 40 generations. But in one of the miracles of environmental restoration, those shed will know where to go. Again the eagle beats his wings to climb above the trees, or the locks of the Rappahannock, what's left of history. Where the council and the contractors over quality disagree, where the present meets the past, and some things never change. For a man can only hold a piece of earth for a lifetime. Water leaks through fingers, you can't hold it at all. I love the Rappahannock and its waters running free. In the rapids of this river, that's where I want to be. From Carter's Run at Waterloo, it drops 300 feet. 47 locks and 50 miles, 1849 complete. With first year's drought and railroads so quickly obsolete, a canal system for just four years in history ever since. For a man can only hold a piece of earth for a lifetime. Water leaks through fingers, you can't hold it at all. I love the Rappahannock and its waters running free. In the rapids of this river, that's where I want to be. An aqueduct in wood crib dam fed power to the mills. And factories and tanneries, the foundations are there still. The concrete dam in 1910, a powerhouse until only 30 years ago, and now a poor man's home. For a man can only hold a piece of earth for a lifetime. Water leaks through fingers, you can't hold it at all. I love the Rappahannock and its waters running free in the rapids of this river. That's where I want to be. In the Bible, there are many, many references to the fish. It is a symbol of life. The symbol of what we kneel and acknowledge in our prayers. And so I found in Ezekiel 47.9 this phrase. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. End quote. A beautiful passage acknowledging those things in life that are so much greater than we. The most powerful force in nature is that of perpetuating the species. And those great unknowns of nature have 
brought these fish every year to that dam, a hundred years plus, to turn back. And now today, by this gathering of wonderful persons, they will soon be free to move up. So I simply say with the greatest humility, dear friends, we are acknowledging today that each of us here is doing God's will. Thank you very much. The big thing that we're so proud of, you know, the city owns 5,000 acres on either side of the river upstream in, in long, thin strips, and we uh, intend to preserve that forever. Well, from a scenic perspective and, and from a water quality perspective, um, the Rappahannock is really a gem. And we're really fortunate. You know, here we are in, in Fredericksburg between Washington and Richmond in a rapidly growing corridor, yet you can still come here and uh, fish and eat the fish and not worry about getting sick. You can swim on a hot summer day and not worry about that. And that's a rare thing. And we want to try and keep that. Being a native Virginian, having been raised just down in Richmond, which uh, has another great river, the James River, where a shed also spawned. Uh, I think this is uh, the right decision at the right time. And we're doing the right thing to uh, improve the uh, aquatic life and recreational purposes of the river. Communities that care about their rivers, that bring them back to life, are healthier places to live. They have a better quality of life. And so all over the country, people should take a lesson from what's happening here and from other dams that have been removed. Poison ivy coats the banks. We climb around the dam. A century and a half of portages, canoes across the land. The dam dam blocks the spawning fish, floods rapids behind its span. I say it's time we blow it up, there's no need for this dam. For a man can only hold a piece of earth for a lifetime. Water leaks through fingers, you can't hold it at all. I love the Rappahannock, and its water's running free. In the rapids of this river, that's where I want to be. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.